for the first time, hopefully in three weeks, we are going Facebook Live soon. <laughs> All right, we are finally Facebook Live. We do good when we're over there in the counseling room. We seem to be just fine. Uh, I'd like to praise the Lord for all of you that are here today. And again, if you are watching via the internet, you're welcome to send in your donations uh, to 11 Climus Road, Montrose, Pennsylvania, 18801. Or you can go on our website, Elisha'sHome.com, and there is a, a little button you can push for donate. Uh, those of you that we normally have our tithes and offerings, we usually have the Ford kids go around doing the offerings, but because of the our distancing that we have to take, there's a little wooden container on your way out on the left today. Just drop your monies, you know, large bills, 100s and $1,000 bills, in that little wooden container out there. We would appreciate it. But uh, I, I just... I am so excited about the, the service that uh, Samuel put together today. And I asked him, I said, so what, what is your theme? And when he told me, I said, well, send me the song that you're going to do your, the video of. And that was uh, Jeremy Camp's uh, In the Moment. And that was so neat, seeing some of those pictures. See, a lot of you don't realize that, and maybe you have, you've heard us say it enough, that what an exciting time for me as a dad to have my three sons, now that's not, I know, name of an old show, <laughs> having my three sons standing up here with myself and my wife, my, th my three promises from God, my three answers from God. And uh, the name of the sermon today is In the Moment or Living in the Moment, and that was my moment. Okay, and, and I, I don't care if you don't like it. That was my moment as a dad to have all three of my sons up here with my wife and I. Because when we ended up, when the Lord, well, I, I told you this years ago that Peggy, when we were dating on the telephone, I know that sounds crazy, but when I told her, well, you can have as many children as you want. She said, I want a dozen. I said, all right, I'll do my best, you know. <laughs> you can't argue with a man who says he'll do his best. But unfortunately, after we had, um, who's laughing over there? Uh, <laughs> When, when we finally ended up getting pregnant with uh, Josh, the doctor told us after he was born, because she had such a rough time, that she would not be able to have any more children. And see, when you listen to the, the doctor's diagnosis, a lot of people get stuck in that. And so I got stuck in that for 15 years. Well, then I became more of a faith preacher. You know, as faith preachers, we believe it until it happens. And then people get angry with us. Because uh, sometimes it doesn't work out right. They'll say, well, see, your faith is weak. No, I'm going to, you know what, you want myself, you want Dave, you want Tim, you want us to pray for you because we're going to pray for you e either until you're healed or until you go to be with the Lord. We're not going to give up on you. But you get these people who say, oh, it's God's will that you die and suffer a terrible death. That's a lie from the pit of hell. And when I, when I finally discovered that, and I've shared this with you before, that the Lord had promised me, and to promise my future wife at the time, that we'd have plenty of children. So I spoke forth what the Word of God said. And I said, we will have more children, just like Sarah's womb will be open. And all of you know the story, that after 16 years, Peggy got pregnant again. And we were so excited, and two and a half, three months in, she had a miscarriage. What a terrible thing to go through, but praise the Lord... He is, his promises are yes and amen. And then, of course, the young, the skinny guy that was up here with us, that's Matthew, and he was the first promise. And he was the promise of the Lord where the Lord told Peggy specifically, you know, a television preacher, and she's, well, you might not believe this, but I, I believe it, as uh, she was walking into the room watching one of our favorite preachers, he was getting ready to pray, and he said, a woman just walked into the room, and she's seeing me on TV at this moment. And he stopped, and he said, God has a promise for you that you are going to have more children. You're going to have a son, and you're gonna, his nickname will be Matt, and, he'll be, and his name will be Matthew. And within a month, she was pregnant. She went to, to the doctor because all the hormones were wicky-wacky ladies. You know what I'm saying? Men, you really know what I'm saying. And uh, they, uh, they went to do an, uh, the ultrasound. They couldn't find anything. She said, well, the doctor wants you to come back in a, uh, a certain amount of time. And we knew what the doctor said. The doctor said he wasn't even there. Said it was a hormone problem because of what they called a blighted ovum, all this fancy stuff. 
But we proclaimed that, no, there is a baby in there and his name is Matthew. And the next time we went, all of a sudden the, the, the lady looks at the paperwork and then she, she says, well, here he is, here it is. I said, is it a boy or a girl? She goes, I can't tell you, but look. Okay then, he's a boy. <laughs> and, we, and we told her the story, he would be Matt. And praise the Lord, Matt was born. Everything went very, very well. Um, and then six or nine months into that, uh, after he was born, devil tried to take him out with a type of leukemia. Couldn't do it. God healed him up. He's doing great today. You saw him. Well, God promised me my Samuel also. Uh, because I wanted more children. And Peggy did too. And look what God did. And each of those moments that we lived in, we lived in faith. You can live in fear and doubt or you can live in faith. It's time to live in the moment. So when I saw and I heard the song that Samuel shared, and I, I hope I get, I, I get my boys' names all mixed up. And they hate that, but that's life. Get over yourselves. You, got, you all three have great names, Joshua, Matthew, and Samuel. You know what can I say? So all three are anointed names. I love you all three just so much. And what's interesting is when you're living in that moment, whether it's good, bad, or ugly, God will watch the, the forming of your character. God never sends tests that are evil. But God watches how we respond to that moment. And, you know, when I was a young kid, I didn't always respond so well. I had a bad temper. And you, you can meet, if you go back to Walla Walla, Washington, you might meet a couple of those people that met my temper, okay? Or when I was in the Navy, some of those sailors that met my temper. But I don't have that temper anymore. God is using the character that he was building in me as a young man to be the man of God that he wants me to be, and he's still working on me. I'm just saying, he's still working on me. And uh, that's all I'm going to say. Anyway, I found a really interesting story from a gentleman named Adam Albright. He's an author and a writer. And I like what he had to say about in the moment. He said, life is full of obstacles. Each and every one of us face some type of adversity during our short time on this earth. It's no matter, it is not a matter of if something will be thrown our way, but when something will be thrown our way. We all know what that feels like. The true personal test comes in the form of our response. How we handle our challenges will reveal our actual character. You know, as you get older, how many of us know what that's like? You know, even as, as uh, those of us that are a little bit over 50, right? Those of us that are a little over 50, and somebody kind of gets us a little angry, we look back and remember, well, when I was in my 20s, I'd clean your clock. <laughs> but I'm not that old now. And, and deep down, I'm going to be honest with you, when I'm watching these uh, YouTube videos or Facebook things where I hear the story about two or three guys trying to break into an old man's house, they didn't realize that he used to be a, a welterweight uh, you know, championship boxer. And, all, and those three guys, were they had to drag him out in an ambulance. You know, like, oops, don't mess with that old man. So I'm just saying that, you know, our, our minds still think like we're young. Our bodies, maybe not quite so much. But, you know, our character, whether we are two or whether we're in our 80s like our brother. How old are you? I know. No, whether we're in our 90s, how, however old Pastor Dave is, because he doesn't think he's that old. He could still whoop anybody I know in racquetball, I bet. I'm serious. Except Tim. Except Tim. Yeah, you don't want to be in a racquetball court with Tim. Unless you've got those big, thick goggles on. You know, that's all I'm going to say. But anyway, as this gentleman tells the story, this really hit home to me. He states, I recently came across the story of Connor Williams. Odds are good that, like me, you have no idea who that was until now. But... Also, like me, I hope you do not soon forget this, uh, this story. Connor grew up overweight, always being the largest kid in class. Given his size, he was, picked, he was picked on mercilessly by classmates. To make matters worse, he had a speech impediment that made public speaking a nightmare. See, so much of this is my story in elementary school. I had to take speech class. I don't know, any of you ever had to do that? Second grade, I had, to, I had a speech therapist. I, had, I was chunky. I couldn't run more than a half a block without dying, so I just, 
I, I could really relate to this. To make matters worse, he had that speech impediment. As time passed, Connor went through his formative years without friends and knowing only pain and rejection. As hard as he tried <laughs> to fit in, other kids just pushed him out. By the time high school approached, he decided to make a change. With the help of his father, he made his own gym and worked every day to transform his body from being a figuratively punching bag for the kids into something different. Connor continued his transformation by picking up a few different sports. With his hard work and dedication, he soon received a scholarship offers from schools around the country. After a college career at the University of Texas, Connor Williams heard his name called as the Dallas Cowboys selected him in the second round of the 2018 NFL Draft. We all love underdog stories, but this one is slightly different. What makes Connor so interesting is not that he made a bad situation into a multi-million dollar football career, but rather his attitude and his perspective. In an open letter to all the bullies in his life, Connor Williams publicly thanked them. And I thought, man, this is so cool. I never had the guts enough to do that. I got back at the bullies, but I never... I'm so, um, anyway, honestly, he went on to say, I don't know how I could have accomplished what I have so far without your teasing. This is the open letter that he gave to these bullies. I don't know how I could have accomplished what I have so far without your teasing, without your isolation, without your rumor mongering, your harassment, your beatings, your constant torment said Connor, I've come a long way from those dark days, and I truly owe it all to you. <laughs> I said, wow. The author continued, I too personally knew the pain of being made fun of growing up overweight. It always amazed me at how ruthless some kids could be with the words. It was not until after college that I decided to make a positive change in my life also, and to get serious about my weight. I will never know what it feels like to play in the NFL, but I can certainly appreciate his sentiments. Being bullied can leave a lasting impact on your life if you allow it. Like Connor, there is a part of me that is thankful that it happened. We have a choice to make when faced with difficulty. We can run from it, hide from it, or fight it. We can seek meaning in it, why, it hap why it's happening, or we can outright dismiss it. The challenges we face do not define us. It is the decisions we make in light of those challenges that do. Isn't that challenging? <laughs> I mean, I so can relate to that because that same thing happened to me in junior high. I got tired of being overweight and stuff, so I started working. I did all that. I got into boxing by high school and stuff. So, you know, I, you look at this wonderful body of a man now, and you're going, how could you have been a third of your weight you are now? That's, that's just those are the young years. But, you know... Uh, I really, I learned that as I grew, that the important thing wasn't how, what a great shape your body was in, but the great shape your soul was in. But it took a while to figure that out. Human beings are perfectly imperfect. Uh-oh, yes we are. We are all guilty of sin in some form or fashion. We are all capable of being both bully and the person being bullied. Some of you might have been that bully. I hope not. I don't have a lot of room for bullies. Even adult bullies. Oh boy, when I come across an adult bully. As a pastor, it's a challenge. And I, I really have to pray. And you're saying, what do you mean? I really have to pray. I told you this story when I, before I was ever a pastor and right before I started into ministry. I used to install burglar and fire alarms, but I was a Christian. I was going to, going to church every day, and not every day, but every time the doors were open, everything was going good. And Peggy and I were married. Uh, Josh was just a little guy, and everything seemed to be going good until I was working out in the real world. And I get these guys pushing me around. Just because I was a Christian, they'd push me around. And the one guy told you the story about every time we'd go out to install a burglar and fire alarm, he would come on to all the women that were there at the place we were at. And I finally told him, I said, you got to stop that. I said, I'm tired of it. It's not, it doesn't make our business look good, and it makes me look bad. And this guy, he threw me up against a car, and he grabbed me by the shirt collar. And now another guy's watching me. And I mean, I see he's watching me. And the guy threatened to beat me up and to kill me and to hurt me and all this stuff. And I just smiled at him. 
I looked at him, I said, buddy, take your best shot, do whatever you want to do. I said, I'm not going to fight you. I'm not going to hurt you, but I guarantee I'm going to turn you into the boss. Oh, you blanked and blank, and you know, he, and he finally let go of me and walked off. I walked right into the boss's office, and the guy that was watching saw the whole thing. He verified everything. The next day, the guy quit. And I told my boss, I said, you don't know all the stuff this guy did. And when I told him, he said, why didn't you come to me sooner? I said, because I didn't want to cause problems. I was hoping his sin would find him out. He had a pager. During those pager days, every time he was on call, you know what he'd do? He'd break his pager. He'd step on it. He goes, oh, my pager broke. And then guess who would get the second call? So I told my boss, I said, all those times your pager, his pager was broke, guess what? It wasn't broke. So I think he was thankful that it worked out the way it did. But you're asking, well, Pastor Rob, why were you so confident? You know what? Because when I was younger and I got beat up, that was life. And I, you know what, though? That wasn't the problem. I had no fear because I knew I was doing what was right. When you know you're doing what is right, the fear of getting hurt is a lot less than the fear of God. How many times have I told you this? I'll be at a grocery store and somebody will give me an extra 10 or $20 when they give me the, my cash back. And I'll, I'll say, well, you gave me too much money. Well, no, I didn't. I said, yes, you did. Look what you did. Oh, I guess you did. I and I look at it and I said, I'm not going to burn in hell just because you gave me too much money. Well, what do you mean by that? I said, I'm going to be honest. You know, I'd rather be honest and not have a lot of money than in hell. So they look at me like I'm, I'm kind of crazy. Well, maybe I am in a good way. But you know, how we deal with the circumstance, really, people will, they, they watch. And I guarantee, even when I was a school teacher and I had a student attack me, or one or two or three of them, my other students were watching every move I made. And they all, one, I told you the story, the one time the guy hit me right in the chin. Hit me in the nose, when I always, and that's why I was a bad boxer, because you hit me in the nose, all I would see is my eyes would water, and you know, hit me in the nose, hit me in the chin, I didn't feel a thing. And my students were all watching the whole thing, waiting for me just to lay this kid out. And I smiled at the kid, and I said, the cops are on the way. And the kids were like, wow, all this time you told us just to turn the other cheek, and you did it. But you know what? Go beyond that. I felt there were angels around me protecting me. I didn't feel a thing. I had no watery eyes. He didn't break anything. I was fine. See, when you have your confidence in the Lord, his strength, look out. You'll do things that you'll never expected you could ever do before. But before I was a Christian, I sure got bruised up a lot. <laughs> I had a swollen head more than I can tell, and it wasn't pride. I'm just saying, I got my nose broke twice when I was boxing. I'm sorry, I just, I learned to duck. No, I didn't. I learned to block the punches with my face. My best friend said, Rob, quit blocking the punches with your face. Use your hands. I, said, I can't help it. So I was not a good boxer. So I'm just saying, when God always protected me, I never felt it. But when I did it on my own, oh, it hurt. And it hurt for a while. See, our moments of challenge can lead to strength or weakness. Like Connor, we can use our hardships and make something out of them. That is, if we have the right mindset. I've noticed a distinct change in the way some people see themselves lately during this whole pandemic. We all have seen how people, you know, people that you thought would be strong might not be so strong. Have you been there for them? Have you called them on the phone? Have you encouraged them? Have you been there for the people that are going through a weak moment? Or maybe you're that person who's feeling a little bit weak right now. Have you called that mentor, that friend, that dad, or that brother? Have you called them up and said, man, I'm having a rough time. I'm really having a rough time. See, there's so often there's that victim mentality that has crept into our, our country. Too often people quickly try to come off uh, as such... But it's, how can I say this? They act like, the, oh, I'm, I'm the victim every time. Well, you know what? We're not always the victim. Real victims do exist in this world. And we should try to help right those wrongs. However, there are many situations such as Connor's where we can face everything and we can rise above that. The choice is ours. How will you respond? 
See, there's a lot of us, you know, we've had, a, we've had it rough the last three months. But you know, there's other people that have had a lot rougher. And a lot of you have had it terrible. But you can rise up above that with the strength of the Lord. My question to you, will you, <laughs> will you all this mo will at this moment, at, this, at whatever moment you're going through, remember, we're in the moment, how will you respond? Will you respond like I've been preaching the last few weeks? I thought, wow. And Pastor Tim and I have told you this. A lot of times what we preach is something that we've been dealing with the last few weeks. A lot of times, what, and I've seen this in the sermons that I've, I said, Peg, my last two months of sermons have prepared me for this last weekend. This last weekend stunk. They just did. I'm just being honest. But because of his strength, he makes me strong. I don't make myself strong. He does it. I can't do it on my own. I mean, I can put on a good show. But honestly, only he can make you strong. Only his spirit in you can make you strong. Like I said, uh, last couple of sermons, how King David had no real father. His real father thought he wasn't even his father. And then King Saul treated him like trash. For 14 years, chased him in the wilderness. How would you like that? But look what happened to David. David turned out to be the apple of God's eyes because he found the father that would be the right father in heaven. So many of us did not have good fathers. But you know what? That's no excuse anymore. We have him. He's our example. Christ was our example. David's secret, and it's funny, as I was looking these scriptures up, I'm going, wow, these are the scriptures I keep using over and over again. Uh, Psalm 17, 9, uh, 17, 1 through 9. And I love how David put this. And I've read this, I think, the last three sermons that I've done. But hear it again. Hear me, Lord. My plea is just. Listen to my cry. Hear my prayer. It does not rise from deceitful lips. Let my vindication come from you. May your eyes see what is right. Though you probe my heart, though you examine me at night and test me, you will find that I have planned no evil. My mouth has not transgressed. That's Psalm uh, 17, I'm going into verse 4. Though people tried to bribe me, I have kept myself from the ways of the violent through what your lips have commanded. My steps, verse 5, held to your path. My feet have not stumbled. Do you see that? My steps have held to his path, not mine. I call on you, my God, for you will answer me. Turn your ear to me and hear my prayer. Show me the wonders of your great love, you who save Save by your right hand those who take refuge in you from their foes. Verse 8. Keep me, and I love this part, and keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who are out to destroy me. You know, I, I shared with you last week or a couple sermons ago, the apple of the eye that came from the original Hebrew belief that as you look into a person's eyes, into their pupil, you will see a reflection of yourself. So keep me, God, as the apple of your eye. As I look into your eyes, Lord, I see my reflection of myself. And you, that means that if the only way you ever can see that reflection is that person has to look directly at you. If they look at an angle, you can't see that reflection. But if they look directly at you, you can see the reflection. So David is saying, Father, you are looking directly at me. I know I am the apple of your eye. And God even said that, that he was. Because God's focus is on you. Whether you know it or not, he loves you. It says that he, he, and I love this part, he even knows how many hairs you have. He's numbered every one of these that slowly keep disappearing. They're getting a little fluffier here, but they're disappearing here. Yours is not. Allison, no, I don't want to see you going bald. Oh, women. Don't even go there. Just don't... <laughs> Oh, Allison, you're still young. Oh, Lord, help this poor woman in the front row. People are watching you. <laughs> anyway, you know, I, I didn't come to respect this, the person I'm about ready to quote until I met Peggy. And she used to tell me, you know, when I was in college, people used to call me. I said, what they call you? They call me Mother Teresa. Now, those of you that know and love Peg, you can totally understand why they would do that. Some of you even call her mom. And she's younger than you. you I, and I totally understand. But she even told me if she wouldn't have married me, she probably would have just become a nun. 
Now, thank God she didn't, because my boys wouldn't be here, you know? But Mother Teresa, and, and one time I was watching her back in the Clinton years, and I loved it. I, I love it when I see a godly person face somebody. What do I mean by embarrassed that they, that they can't say nothing? And all those of you that knew and loved Bill Clinton, that guy could really woo a crowd. He was a great speaker. And he was sitting there just hamming it up, talking to everybody one time, and his guest was Mother Teresa. And I'm watching this and go, hmm, I've heard about this woman. I'm curious. She gets up there and she gets that finger. The, I call it the Peggy finger now. And she said, God is going to hold you accountable for every child that has been aborted. And oh my Lord, she took off. And she land blast, she just, blah, 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 and whoa, woman, go for it. And when she was done, she sat down. And I was impressed with Bill. He just said, what can I say? That was it. He did not refute her. He didn't rebuke her. I was impressed. I, not very many things impressed me about Bill. But that impressed me. Now think about that. So Mother Teresa said, be happy in the moment. That's enough. Each moment is all we need, not more. But see, you have to know what she did. Was it Calcutta is where she started an orphanage? And when you ever look, is that right? She, she went there in India and she changed the lives of all these orphans. And I mean, these, these kids were starving to death and she was there for them. Another scripture that I, I found myself repeating is Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 30. Now, I love that Passion Translation, Matthew 6, 30. It says, So if God has clothed, clothed the meadow with hay, and those of us that are farmers can really relate to the hay season type, and I think some of them say with flowers or with grass. So if God has clothed the meadow with hay, which is here for such a short time, and then dried up and burned, won't he provide for you clothes you need, even though you live with such little faith? Verse 31, so then forsake your worries. Why would you say, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For that is what the unbelievers chase after. Doesn't your heavenly Father already know the things your body require? Verse 33, so above all, constantly chase after the realm of God's kingdom and the righteousness that proceeds from him. Then all these less important things will be given to you abundantly. Verse 34, refuse to worry about tomorrow, but deal with each challenge that comes your way, one day at a time. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Now you think about that. And you know, our graduates that we, we, we prayed for, again, I think there were Summer and a couple of the other young people weren't here today. But I think we had like six graduates. But the first thing, that as, as um, Matthew and Josh prayed over Sam, and then prayed over Skylar, first thing that jumped in my heart was, you know, you are at the perfect age to be chasing, to be God chasers. Like I said, there's a book called God Chasers from Tommy Tenney, a great book. You are at the age that you can change this world Amen. for the Lord. I mean, I didn't get saved until I was 19. You all can change the world if you don't go to the ways of this world. Abraham Lincoln said, I don't know who my grandfather was. Did you know that? But I am much more concerned to, and to know what his grandson will be. Now, did you get that? Allison, did you get that? And you're in the front row. He's saying, I did not know my grandfather, but I am much more concerned to know what his grandson will be or turn out to be. That's him. He was more concerned about that. And then I was reminded of Queen Esther. In Esther, uh, the, in the Old Testament, in Ephesians, uh, Esther 4, starting in verse 13 and 14, you have to know the story. That during that time, uh, the Jews were in, uh, they were enslaved, and they, the king had, had all these wives and concubines, and he found favor in a, a Jewish woman named Esther. And, uh, of course, there was the enemy of the Jews, and this one guy that was a, was the right-hand man of the, of the king, 
he decided he was going to get the king to, to make an uh, edict, I hope I said that right, or a, a proclamation about anybody who does not worship you know, the king and worship any other god, that basically they should be killed. And when Queen Esther's uncle, Mordecai, no, did I get that right? Yes, Mordecai heard about it. He tore his clothes and he was depressed because the whole nation could be wiped out. And this is what happened when she found out that he was bummed out and upset about it. She sent, she sent uh, I think it, they said his, her head eunuch to him to find out why he was upset. In Esther 4.13 it says, Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, Relief and deliverance will arise from the Jews, from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. I mean, he's being pretty rough with her, because she's sitting there going, well, what can I do? Because, see, if you went before the king and he didn't call you, most people were killed instantly. They had people waiting to stab you, and even a queen. And went on to say, and, and this is my favorite part, So he said, from the Jews from another place, and you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. That God had put her in that place to save the Jewish people. If you read the rest of the story, you'll find out. And one of my favorite preachers, uh, Dr. Tony Evans, who recently lost his wife to cancer, wrote this really powerful message uh, concerning for such a time as this. He said, it, for such a time as this, is a phrase that's tossed around very frequently, often without much thought to the original meaning or context in which it was said, it can mean, it can mean special, chosen, or royal. Many people even quoted Mordecai's rebuke to Esther as a life verse representing power and favor. You'll see t-shirts, hats, and mugs, and social media posts that proudly ring out for such a time as this. But, what did the phrase really mean? When we look at the life of Esther throughout the book titled in her name, this phrase actually refers to Esther being scolded for her self-indulgence, her self-preserving uh, self mindset. In today's language, we might call that being shot down for having a narcissist tendencies. Wow, he's a pretty powerful guy. Mordecai. <laughs> He reproved Esther for living large and embracing royalty over righteousness, selfies over service. Through, the, through those telling words, he reminded her she had been chosen to set her own interests aside, let go of her own ambitions, and face an enemy full on. She was to risk her life and her legacy with no guarantees of a positive outcome. That's the for such a time as this that Mordecai challenged Esther to accept. See, for such a time as this, Samuel and Schuyler, are you willing to realize that God has you on this earth for a specific reason to do something to glorify God? Have you thought about that? And it might not be going to the mission field today or tomorrow or the next year or the next year, but is preparing to share with people Christ. It might be at your workplace, it might be at college, or any of us. Are you willing for such a time as this to glorify the Lord? Something to think about, isn't it? Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not imagine that you're in the king's palace. And I just thought, isn't that powerful? Do not imagine that you're in there just for the fun of it. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise. Wow. So, and for such a time as this, God also set before you and me. God has given each of us a job, a position, resources, education, and more. God has opened an opportunities to optimize his kingdom's purposes through you. He didn't place, and I love this, he didn't place you or me where we are so we can eat figs all day long, <laughs> eat figs all day long, <laughs> or post pictures on social media. He's placed us wherever we are because we are in the midst of a battle, a war. You and I are in the midst of a seismic conflict 
involving good versus evil. Do you realize that? Have you seen it on social media? To miss a, <laughs> I hope so. To miss a kingdom assignment because we've become too caught up in our own personal kingdom is one of the greatest tragedies we could ever face. An entire nation was grateful for how Esther responded to his rebuke. Their lives were spared. How many souls can be spared in, this, in the culture where we live today when we choose to step up to service, even if it involves sacrifice? Are we willing to do that? Are you all willing to do that, no matter what? In this new normal, how will you react to each moment? How will you react? One of the songs that Sam picked was that song I, I shared earlier, Keep Me in the Moment. And I thought, well, maybe you don't know what's behind that song. So let me just share very quickly. Popular Christian singer Jeremy Camp had, has topped the Pillboard, Pillboard, yep. Yeah. I, they call it the Billboard ch charts, and so more than, hmm, more than five million albums worldwide. But his success doesn't mean his life has always been as easy and a happy one. Jeremy endured a family tragedy, and his testimony of that loss has gone on, on to not only inspire a hit worship song and an upcoming major motion picture. Some of you actually went and saw that, okay? But yep, but. It also led people to follow Christ. The new Jeremy Camp movie, I still believe, about his journey topped the box office charts in, in its limited release before the theaters had to shut down due to the epidemic. What happened was, or what happened to Jeremy Camp's first wife? This is the big thing. Jeremy was on stage when he met his first wife, Melissa Lynn Henning Camp. I was singing and I looked up and there was Melissa with her hands raised up so high, you could tell she was really worshiping Jesus, shared Jeremy. So he fell in love with this girl that was worshiping the Lord with, in, in every possible way. They married in 2000, but Jeremy lost his first wife to ovarian cancer after they'd been married for less than four months. He was 23 and she was only 21. But Melissa left a legacy that continues to inspire and bring others to Christ. She shared that if her death could have saved just one soul by bringing them to Christ, that she would know her purpose here on earth had been fulfilled. While grappling with her death, Jeremy wrote his hit song, I Still Believe. I remember not wanting to ask God why, but I finally did. He said, Jeremy, I don't always want you to know why, because I want you to have a testimony of walking by faith. How many of us have asked, Lord, why have you allowed this to happen in my life? Why have I suffered so much? Why has my loved one gone through this or somebody I know and so on? And sometimes you'll get an answer, but other times you won't. The answer that I got when I asked, him, I asked the Lord about the miscarriage. He finally showed me a vision. I shared with you before. He showed me a vision of the Lord holding my daughter in his hands and saying, Rob, this side of heaven, you will not understand the answer. So just know that she is in my arms. And you, one day you'll get to be with her again. And sometimes God doesn't answer how we expect him to answer. But look how many people have touched, have been touched because of his testimony. So let me share with you the, the words to this song. It says, I've been thinking about time, and where does it go? How can I stop my life from passing me by? I don't know. Hmm. I've been thinking about family and how it's going, to, going so fast. Will I wake up one morning just wishing that I could go back? I've been thinking about lately, maybe I can make a change and let you change me. So with all my heart, this is my prayer. Singing, oh Lord, keep me in the moment. Help me live with my eyes wide open. Because I don't want to miss what you have for me. Oh Lord, show me what matters. Throw away what I'm chasing after. Because I don't want to miss what you have for me. Keep me in the moment. Oh, keep me in that moment. Because I don't want to miss what you have for me. When I wake up in the morning, Lord, search my heart. Don't let me stray. I just want to stay where you are. All I got is one shot, one try, one go around this beautiful life. Nothing is wasted when everything is placed in your hands. Oh, Lord, keep me in the moment. Help me live with my eyes wide open. Because I don't want to miss what you have for me. Throw away what I'm chasing after because I don't want to miss what you have for me. Keep me in the moment. Lord, keep me in that moment. 
I've been thinking about heaven and the promise you hold. So it's all eyes on you until the day you call me home. Singing, oh Lord, keep me in the moment. Help me live with my, wa- with my eyes wide open. Because I don't want to miss what you have for me. Over and over again he says that. But it's so true. Don't miss what God has for you. Live in the moment for Christ, not for yourself. Don't be self-centered. Be Christ-centered. Finally, in Matthew 6.33 it says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. One of my favorite verses in Ecclesiastes, and again it used to be a favorite song when I wasn't a Christian, it says there's a time and a place for everything under the season. Remember? Well, Ecclesiastes 3.1. You, you all remember that. Yeah. The birds. <laughs> yep. And what's interesting is they took a right out of the scriptures. In Ecclesiastes 3.1. There's a season and a time appointed for everything. And a time for every delight and event on, or purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up the lost. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear apart and a time to sew together. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Are you, though, willing to live in this moment for Christ? See, we don't know what tomorrow will bring. I'd like you all to stand, please. I don't do this very often. But I, I want I, if you feel led to repeat after me, I believe this is such a great uh, declaration, if you want to call it, but something that should be in your heart. So just repeat after me. Lord, turn my heart and my mind toward you and toward the role you have chosen for me to live out. Help me to put your will and your purpose Ahead of my own. I humbly bow before you. And ask for your direction and guidance. As well as your courage. To live out the calling. I have been given. For such a time as this. Let's pray. Father I ask that you bless and anoint. Those words that people gave. Those words that they repeated. That they would truly seek what they are supposed to do for you for such a time as this. Bless everyone as they go their separate ways, Lord. I believe that this is going to be an exciting week for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week in the Lord, everybody.